Hello, my name is Greg Madison, and this is The Living Process. Thanks very much for watching. This time, uh, my guest is Kevin McEvenue, and we talk about Kevin's development of whole body focusing, for which he is very well known throughout the focusing world. Kevin first came to focusing after learning Alexander Technique. So we talk a little bit about how he takes both what he learned from Alexander and what he learned from Eugene Gentlin and puts them together into a slightly different understanding of the body and body process, which he calls whole body focusing. We also go on to talk a little bit about how he first met Gene Gentlin and then some descriptions of whole body focusing and a more recent development coming out of Kevin's work and his community of whole body focusers, which is called Heartfelt Conversations. And that's a very interesting, more relational kind of version of focusing and whole body focusing. And we find in our conversation itself that we are an example or an instance of what Kevin means by heartfelt conversation. Kevin and I first met many years ago when we were both on faculty at the Focusing Institute Summer School. And we became friends and have been focusing partners ever since. So I think you'll see our conversation has a warmth to it and a connection that I think uh, brings out some of the deeper aspects of uh, what Kevin has described in his practice of whole body focusing. I hope you enjoy this episode with Kevin McEvenue. I'm very pleased to say that I'm speaking with Kevin McEvenue today. Welcome, Kevin. So the first thing that I'd like to ask you about, like I do with everyone, is just how did you get into focusing? How did you find your way into this strange world? By accident. Mm -hmm. I never heard of the word focusing until my mentor, Mary Armstrong, heard a, a voice on um, on the radio. Gene Gentleman was doing a recording or at least or a, a, a broadcast. And she said, that's the man I got to know. Who is he? So it was the sound of his voice that led her to explore focusing. Mm -hmm. And then I, because I'm part of a little group, I did, I went with her and, uh, but that wasn't the first connection with Gene Genlin. It was actually Pete and Ed in um, Biospirituality. Somebody else saw that they were coming to Toronto and they have almost forced me or strong armed me into coming to this workshop. So that was my first introduction, and I didn't think it would be very much. I mean, I've been to other workshops, huh. but there was something that happened in that workshop that blew my mind, basically. And I spoke in a sort of spiritual group right out of turn. Like I, I just sort of yelled or screamed or made a sound because the invitation was to invite a felt sense to shine a light on a part of me that I hated the most. Wow. And I did. And that's where the whole thing blew up. Mm -hmm because the words that came out is, I'm loved, I'm loved, hmm. which was the opposite of my expectation. 
Mm -hmm. so I knew then that there was something in this process called focusing. Wow, that's a very profound beginning. And from there, then, did you go on to learn focusing or did you then go into Alexander technique? How did that happen? I was an Alexander teacher, so I that was my practice and the my mentor, Mary, was having Alexander sessions with me on an arm that was problematic for her, which was a story, again, in focusing that opened up the door of her own revelation. Mm -hmm. But for me, I trained in Toronto in focusing with her, because mm -hmm. she would go back and forth from Chicago and train us together. But it was only at the first focusing conference where I actually went to Chicago and met Jean Chenman. Mm -hmm. um, quite know what to say here. I was looking for somebody who would inspire me in some way. Actually, he didn't. <laughs> uh, but I was looking for something. I was looking for a connection. Yeah. He was very present. So how I was, but I couldn't feel him in where he was. And I needed that sense of connection to feel safe enough to experience something happening between us. Mm -hmm. It was much later in a, again, a surprise situation where I got a really deep sense of him. I'm curious about that, but I, I want to just say that back to you that right from the beginning, it was the relational aspect that was fundamental to you experiencing yourself yes that's what i was looking for and actually that's what i needed mm -hmm. in life mm -hmm. and so are you saying that you did get that from gene later on in some way Yes, I it was I was doing teaching or I was doing summer school where he would be there. Mm -hmm. We did it for about ten years as a um, uh, support for the institute, and he would love to take time out for a cigarette, and we go out, and uh, while he's having a cigarette, I asked him something. I asked him to support a book that my friend had published on whole body focusing about the body. And I had sent him a copy, but he looked at me and he says, you know, I know nothing about the body. And I was, you know, a little bit shocked. And he says, well, but please use anything that I do know something about, whatever I've written, feel free to um, put that on the recommendation or page, wherever it might be useful. The moment he owned that I know nothing about something, mm -hmm. I could feel his presence totally and completely as, a, as though his felt sense just light lit up mm -hmm. i almost could feel it where in the body what it looked like what it felt how it um, pulsated mm -hmm. that was the connection that i was looking for he was alive in his own process 
he may not want to share a dialogue with me in the way that I wanted it, but I got it this way. And from that moment on, there was no ever a question of what focusing in particular, what felt sensing is. That's so really, I'm, yeah, that's really interesting to me that it's when he admitted not knowing something that you felt he was more accessible in some way that somehow you had more direct connection to him as a person as a person yes yeah yeah there's a lot there there's just the saying it and hearing it back i felt him as a person that was so important to me yeah, that's what I'm picking up, is that's what you mean by the relational or the connection or something, is when the 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 person, it's a weird way to say it, but the person in the other person <laughs> has some kind of direct contact with you as a person, something person to person somehow. That's where something happens in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Suddenly that whole mm -hmm. experience in me and the larger experience of me mm -hmm. becomes present. Yeah. But how would you describe whole body focusing to somebody who's new to it? The words themselves seem to... Uh, speak for themselves with the sense that the felt sense of, of myself as an experience becomes a whole embodied experience of me. Mm -hmm. And it comes for actually from the original statements of Alexander, who said that for a fundamental same change of perception, all of us have, the whole of us needs to accommodate that change. So it's not just a, a thought, mm -hmm. it's an entire process that needs to undergo a reorganizing inside the self. And when I started to integrate focusing in Alexander, somebody, one of my clients said, oh, that's what it is. This is the focusing and then the body work. This feels like a whole body focusing experience. Mm -hmm. So it's only an it's a, simply an add-on, really. It's nothing magic or something separate. It's actually an appreciation that focusing embodies the sense of the whole person. Yeah, I would I, I want to talk about it a bit more because having experienced both, um this is what I would say that a whole body focusing experience which in some way is probably implied in any focusing experience it can be you would agree with that yeah yeah it can be more explicitly attended to as a whole body kind of process and when you do that, um, it, I would say it's almost like the body comes alive in a slightly different way than if you're attending to just a felt sense in the chest, for example. I would say if you're attending to a felt sense in the chest, your whole body is implicated somehow. There's things happening all over the place that are a part of that. But your attention might be more focused on the chest area 
and that what comes could be more um, easily related to one's life issues or something. Whereas in whole body focusing, it can be such a physically enlivened kind of process that sometimes it's not so clear. It's clear that something healing is happening, but it's not always clear if it relates to a specific issue or concern. What do you think about that? I think that is true. It isn't always um, manifested in words or images. Yeah. And some of us uh, are more familiar with being in this experience in movement. Let's take a, a moment with that. Because the movement is active, alive, and purposeful. Yeah. So the pain in the chest, for example, or the, the suffering may just be what it is, a suffering. But when a focusing is applied to it as a possibility of purposefulness or intention, something emerges appropriate to that situation, it's appropriate to that person. Yeah. Some people are more thinking more or more feeling different varieties of experiencing when appropriate. Sometimes like the suffering will continue and not speak because the revelation of what needs to happen isn't ready to reveal itself until the structure of whatever needs to be in place happens. Can you say more about that, that the structure that needs to be in place, like there's some kind of grounding or some kind of way of holding the experience that has to be available? Or what do you mean by that? I'd say there's a something that you're touching into as a whole background feeling of stuck places frozen parts of ourselves. The first step is that once it's noticed, it begins to be activated. Hmm. It is could be a thought, but more importantly, in a felt sense kind of way, that activation starts to change the structure of the experience. Yeah. And that takes time and has a lot of strange associations with it. it isn't, oh, this hurts more, or, or that's about this. There's a lot of implications around a new structure emerging that needs time to form a, um, a response that would fit what's needed here. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say that back to you to make sure that I get it, because I think this is where it's a little bit different from kind of more traditional focusing um, in some way, but it's very difficult to say exactly how. Um, but what you're saying is that in whole body focusing, you pay attention to the body. You have to, that's how you participate in the process. It needs your attention. And in response to that, paying attention, potentially something comes alive. And that can be, a, you didn't say it this way, but I would say that can be a fundamental restructuring of the body that has all sorts of implications that you probably couldn't even fathom what all those implications would be is that right yes beautifully put actually i'm just again absorbing what you're saying because my process needs time to pick up what you're saying and mm -hmm. fit into 
my experience, which isn't always the same. Yeah. But it also ties in with my experience of Gene Genlin when he admitted or he said, I don't know anything about that, actually activated a knowing in him that probably would not have immediate words. It's too big. It's, uh, it's his whole life. It's, uh, uh, it's what he writes about. Mm -hmm. So if I do a little bit of an example in physically, which is about what I do as a natural body minded personality, if I put up my hand like that and I br bring a human consciousness to it, so I'm noticing in a bodily way that there's a hand here and I look at it and I invite it to be there. Mm -hmm. I invite it to experience itself as a hand. And then I step back. And I step back even further and I observe the hand taking on a life of its own in a holistic kind of way. And it just doesn't stop there. It's not just the hand that's activated. You can't see my toes moving, but the toes are also moving. And then other parts of me naturally connect with the invitation to be present in a whole body kind of way. And as I look at my hand and I feel me, mm -hmm. there's love there. There's a connection. Ah, you, there's a connection. Mm. Almost like surprise. Yeah. And there's love. Love is happening between me and a part of me. One of my sayings in, in my this type of work is when a part of me feels loved, it awakens to its own healing process. I don't know how to heal it, mm -hmm. but within itself, it has its own felt sense of what it needs to become more fully what it is, like a hand, if, it, if it's something that's wounded or fully healed. And to me, it's, it's miraculous, mm -hmm. but it requires my own human contribution that's the part I play, I notice, I invite. It reminds me of the first experience you described where you had this experience of shining a light on a part of you that you hated. And your response was, it's loved. Yes. Yes. It was a very sensitive part. It was my own history of sexuality, of feelings in the Catholic environment. Mm -hmm. And it was really something you don't dare look at. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the experience shifted from what is thought to be hateful to something else. Yeah. And it was very physical and it was very emotional mm -hmm. at all levels of myself. That's where I, I started to speak out and cry and something's mm -hmm. happening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When you give your example of looking at your hand um, and how the hand comes alive in response to being accepted and given space and being loved and then it connects to your feet other aspects of your body so it becomes a whole body connection somehow that does seem slightly different than more traditional focusing where often it's in the middle part of the body whereas here it could start in any part of the body seems like to me 
and the bodily response can be quite physical. It's not just kind of the the feeling of me that you can sense in a felt sense. It's it can be the physical response of the hand moving in a particular way and then connecting to another part of the body. It's like something is coming alive, just like in the more traditional focusing process, something is coming alive, but it's almost like the way of it's coming alive or the way it um, almost the avenue of living itself is slightly different in some way. It is slightly di different in one way, but it's not separate. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I agree. It's not separate. Yeah. Because as you speak that way and you, you bring it up that way, I realize where it, when I feel a connection with another person, I feel that in my center. Yes. And I need it. I feel supported by life. I need to live in this world where there are people. And mm -hmm. I look for a hunger for, hopefully for a mother or a father who is there that gave me the sense of connection to life that I naturally reach out for. Mm -hmm. I have a, a grandson totally unexpectedly at my age to have a grandson. And I was given the baby, which is about six months old, to hold. And I was a bit nervous, wondering what to do with a, a with a baby. And I, you know, went back and thought, well, what do other people do? Well, I usually say oh, how lovely the baby is and reassure the baby that it's welcome all that kind of conversation. But something in me did something quite different. I held this body. Mm -hmm. I felt the life in the body. I felt the life in me and I waited. As though this body knew exactly what it was looking for and took a pause and checked it out and connected with me, pushed against me. And it seemed to lit up like a Christmas tree. His smiles, his gestures, his aliveness took off because there was a connection with a human life mm -hmm. that he absolutely needs in order to grow his own life. Mm -hmm. it wasn't even about me. He was very sweet and lovely seemed to be very loving, but in the end, it was really about his life, needing a solid grounding mm -hmm. presence to grow his own life. That the connection with you was grounding for his own life process. Yes, precisely. Yeah. That's fundamental to life, I think, and focusing offers this as a possibility what it would feel like. I learned everything in that moment about how it works. That's interesting. I want to go back to the first way that you said it as well, because you said the connection comes in the middle, that feeling of really connecting with the other person. And that's the fertile ground within which something else might come alive but that has to be there yes yeah it's interesting um so i want to ask just because this is a big interest of mine what is it do you think after years of this practice, Alexander Technique, anything else that you've done, how do you understand that coming alive in you? What is that that 
ignites and sort of takes off in its own aliveness. Just again, as I take your words in, and the question, and I would say that whether I recognize it or not, my body and my mind, my desires, we're always looking for something and not getting it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps other people are looking for something and they may get it. Um, in my own story, there was something that I needed desperately to feel my own life and I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. But I kept searching. And I think that's that's a, that's a development of a need that, although it's unfulfilled, may even take a lifetime or not be filled, will create an energy and an exploration of what is needed in my life. So I create all kinds of systems and practices to search for something that's deeply meaningful. So I don't know what that is until I do. And then I do. And I probably had those moments right through my life that defined the kind of life I am, how the person I am. But I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have ever anyone saying, oh, I understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. There's certain people that I met for a moment even. Yes, that's the person I can relate to. And in my practice, I help each of us to find out what we're looking for, a sense of self, let's call it. But it began to emerge that there was something more than that in my body. And I had this kind of strange symbolizing. and went like, there it is. There it is. And it happens sometimes, not always. Hmm. And that's what we're both looking for. The energy seems to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There and there. And I know what that is. I'm a part of it. But if something happens, transition in my body at least that I know who I am I don't search for who I am mm -hmm. something in me knows who I am and has always known who I am mm -hmm. yeah I'm just I'm just digesting that a bit because when you say that what it makes me remember are times when I feel more deeply who I am. It's a different sense of who I am. And oddly, it's almost like a less um, defined. Somehow there's more openness to it. There's less definition to it and it feels more me rather than less me and you said it beautifully it's like a par it's the opposite of the paradox it's a mystery mm -hmm. the who i am is coming from a much broader space yeah of that experience exactly yeah yeah and i know that you're you're developing this even more relationally into, I think, what you've called heartfelt conversations. Yes. Can you say a little bit about that? How that fits with what you've been saying so far? 
seems a further development. It is a further development from the um, focusing practices that I would normally have or right. expected or trained. Um, and, and how do I put that into words? Well, it goes back to the beginning. I need to feel a connection with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And if I can't feel a connection with somebody else, it's hard to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Classic example of that, and I think it was you who said, well, someone sent me a person who came in thinking I was a psychotherapist, which I'm not. And um, told me her whole story about how unhappy her life was. And I said, oh, this is, this is very difficult this to endure when I have no resources whatsoever to be helpful. That's not what I do. But in her storytelling, she says something about her mother-in-law. And I could feel, boom, in my belly, something really powerful about how she felt about her mother-in-law. I said, oh, that's where we can have the conversation. That's where we can connect. The problem with that particular situation was, um, I, I mentioned to her, oh, thank you for your story. And I'm just curious about how you feel about your mother-in-law. And she said, what are you talking about? I don't feel anything about my mother, my, my mother-in-law. And I realized we can't have a conversation. So heartfelt connection is where we're grounded enough and have the skills to be present to another person's experience and my own at the same time. I can make space for you. Mm -hmm. And you can make space for me. And sometimes that connection will go into a, a focusing, more formal, traditional psychotherapy formal modality where something's there, I just need attention. And we can switch. And I can be present to listen to someone else's experience until they feel safe enough to reveal whatever they're feeling inside themselves. And you, I support that story until they become naturally curious of how that is for me to be present to their experience or to any experience. Uh, there's this transition when they feel uh, fully satisfied, they feel heard, they understand, they can be with curiosity brings naturally towards how are you what's mm -hmm. going on and when i'm able to meet that and say well actually this or that of how it felt for me this is this is how it impacted on me for example something happens between us mm -hmm. Uh, let me say that back to you, that much of it. Um, because it, one of the things it's making me think of is there's an Israeli woman, Yudit First, who I've interviewed, who's developed social-oriented focusing, which sounds similar to what you're talking about. Then there's your development from whole-body focusing, where people sometimes are standing and going through a whole-body process with somebody accompanying them and yet you're bringing it more relationally than this focusing oriented therapy which at least some of us are developing more relationally so that's the first thing i'm noticing is how 
all these different focusing practices are naturally wanting to be more relational in some way rather than always designating one person as the experiencer and another person as the the witness or the listener or whatever a more mutual relating seems to be emerging in the focusing world and sort of different practices but so i think that's interesting but i want to get back to what you were just saying because it sounds like so i want you to correct me it sounds like it's possibly at least an eye eyes open kind of experience where like right now i'm speaking with you and attending to you while simultaneously paying attention to my own bodily experience and what's rising and falling within me even as i say these words to you and i'm not designated necessarily as a special person in this relationship i'm designated as an equal person and quite naturally like i can see your head moving now i'm already becoming more curious about how my words are landing in you and whether my bodily movements are in any way synchronized with what's happening with you as a person. The word comes right away. I'm not alone in my experience. Yeah. That's powerful. I am not alone my experience it doesn't have to be exactly the same experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the loneliness of life is also part of our need for connection yeah definitely yeah i'm just shaking i'm just that's so true that's so like i can feel the, the wanting and the The, the heartfelt connecting. And of course, it works with people who are more or like, less like, similar to me, or people who understand and appreciate our uh, differences and able to tolerate other people's having a completely different point of view. So mm -hmm. it's an easy match necessarily. Also, there are so certain problems of getting close to another person, understanding each other, like may trigger certain patterns of early life expectations and disappointment. So it's a complex uh, possibility that has wonderful benefits, but also some dangers. But I still think it's worth it to enter into a, a, con a meaningful conversation with another person where I feel I'm not alone in the world. Yeah. And I have some side of They can be very different people. Um, I remember just one in a camp, I was on a breakout room and this man was in Uganda at a prison camp um, but he knew focusing and somehow I could feel this his beingness and we weren't talking about situations in which since that suddenly I know this person in a completely different world and that's a good person and there was a real feeling of I know this person, which makes us equal. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that moment of connection. That changes my perception of people around me and around the world. Yeah. I, again, I want to just make sure I've caught that. It's not about you and the other person agreeing. 
And it's not necessarily even about you understanding the other person. It's about that deep connecting, which is at least partly a willingness to be affected by that other person so that they feel that someone has taken them in in some way and it's you taking in your example you taking in that other person gave you a sense of them as that's what i don't know how to say as um I'm tempted to say kind of the fundamental living that they are or something like that. As I say, I can see it was searching for the word. If I say he's, or he's like me, another human being mm -hmm. who suffers, struggles, and would like more, um, support really mm -hmm. and there it is because we can feel each other as people it would be natural to want to support that person be more of that and i think that's basically behind my own work of working with people or in relationship I want to support their lives to be more rewarding or more. Don't even have to define rewarding. Mm -hmm. And would it, I would want the same. And actually, as I can feel their lives expanding and feeling like my hand, there's love there. Mm -hmm. It does too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. In that deeper connecting with them, you get at least some of what you also need. Yes, exactly. Yes. But also you're saying something that I think is worth making explicit, if I've understood it. You're saying, I think, that there's this kind of connecting that is a bridge beyond all of the differences between you and that person. Yes, and that's where you go into the, um, there's another word I call it, that came for me that participatory spirituality, and it would it comes from scripture actually would say, when two or more people come together in my name, I am here. And the experience of there it is, would mm -hmm. be we're sharing life together in this larger space. We're participating in. And we're not the we're not God. Mm -hmm. We're not but we can participate in the spiritual atmosphere if we can allow our minds to be more in that modality. And that happens when this kind of conversation is allowed to surface, we feel that there's a larger presence helping us understand our differences. I don't think I could understand your differences and mine, and that there was something bigger behind it all to enable in me to have the space to appreciate you. I'm not sure that my my ego would, or my, think a sense of my, how good I am, I can understand you. I don't think I'm that good. I think I need, I need the space mm -hmm. to facilitate your life next door to my life. Mm -hmm. Something bigger enables me to take that in. So I want to say that back to you in the way that I'm getting it as I hear you. Um, that there's something spacious 
in connecting to the sense that it's the same life that's living both of us in our own unique ways. You've said it so beautifully. I love the way you, you're able to paraphrase words that capture the essence of the experience. Because that's exactly what touches mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to... <laughs> I feel like saying I don't want to claim that ability. It doesn't quite come from me. It sort of comes through me. It's it's like my body is gathering up what you're saying and making it into a, a paraphrase of some in some way, but I don't feel responsible for that happening in some way. Uh, well, I love it. I love the, way, the shyness of it because that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I learned some time ago long time ago, but I don't know how to be with you. But something in me does. Mm -hmm. And I listen to the guidance of how that would work between us in a way that I can't imagine. And you're doing much the same and putting it out that way. It's not just you, but mm -hmm. something speaking through you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's how it works. And I'd like to like that. That's just how it works. I just work here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just work here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. That I think that really is a good way to say it. Yeah, that feels perfect. Yes. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, first of all, again, you're saying, how is that for me in this last piece? And I realized that I'm enjoying the experience. I read one of your posts, the first one, and then I decided it was so good that I dare, dare not read any more because I didn't want to fill my mind with amazing uh, conversations until I connected with you and see what's there for me first. Now I can go back and enjoy these, because what you're doing is you're creating a an invitation to have heartfelt conversations. Mm -hmm. And you're doing such a good job of it, technically, all those things. I'm even jealous, but luckily, I don't have to. At my age, I don't have to, to be the the one who does that all, or makes that all happen. But you do. You still have a lot more work. It's good. It's good what you're doing. So I'm just enjoying the experience. Thank you. And I feel like saying, I just work here. <laughs> Well, I would think that I hope you continue to work here and to your own well-being to facilitate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.